Hi, thanks for watching this video. Uh, this is a presentation that is given at the EAG 2015 uh, by one of my colleagues. Uh, my name is Junwei from Itasca Microseismic and Geomechanic Evaluation Image. The title of this presentation is A New Finite Difference Econo Equation Solver for an Isotropic Medium. And actually, the tools that I'm going to present to you is not new at all. It's actually very uh, well established in a different field like optical physics, computer graphics, and medical image. It's just it's different from most people are using in our community. The classic tools that we use to calculate the travel time include ray tracing, fast marching if you heard of it, wavefront construction. And in this presentation I just want to show you when those techniques get challenged in a, a particularly a low symmetry and isotropic media. For example if you're gonna a refract a previously hydraulic fractured reservoir model, your starting uh, model may likely to be orthorhombic or even triclinic. And in addition, the degree of anisotropy is not homogeneous. It depends on where you put in the fractures in the previous fracturing. So in those scenarios, we do have another tools in our toolbox to tackle uh, the uh, the challenges like, like that. I always use this picture to demonstrate that the complexity of ray tracing, one of the classic tools, increase with the complexity of the velocity model. As you can see here, uh, a point source is located in a smoothly varying heterogeneous model. The ray angle is constant at the source location, but that uniform uh, fan feature is not reserved as you move away from the source because of the heterogeneity. So a few issues arise. One is the multipathing. If you have a source here and receiver here, you will have multiple ray passes that introduce a non-uniqueness issue in the ray tracing problem. The other issue is the shadow zone. Uh, the velocity structures are like that, such that uh, the rays will bypass a zone and forms a shadow. So if you have a receivers in the shadow uh, zone or behind the shadow zone, the ray tracing is very difficult and it may not uh, converge. Uh, anisotropy add another dimension to this problem. So in addition to the multipathing and the shadow zone issues, uh, there is multiple wavefront branches due to anisotropy alone. Uh, particularly for the shear wave, as you can see in a simple example here, uh, this is a full waveform solution in a homogeneous tilted transversal isotropic model uh, the point source is actually not on this plane. The point source is off the plane, um, but you can see we have quasi SV wave develop this so-called the triplication, and we have a quasi SH wave. So if you have a receivers here, you're going to record early arrival, which is the SV wave. You're going to also record a late arrival, which could be SH, and a multiple shear wave in between. And that case becomes worse if the model is triclinic. Uh, is low symmetry uh, anisotropic. For example, a triclinic model, uh, you're going to record an early shear wave and a late shear wave and a multiple shear wave in between. And if you're going to trace rays, you have to trace all of them, and you have to know which one you're tracing. This is not this is not trivial. And I'm going to show you a topography in a ray parameter space, which is defined by the theta and phi, which is the shooting angle in a homogeneous triclinic model. In the color corresponding to the differences between your shooting ray ending point and the target point where you want to go. So the red corresponding to a large distance uh, mean basically means you failed to reach your target point and blue means a, 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 a close distance meaning that you reached your target point. So for the P wave no big deal. We have a, a unique global minimum. But for the shear, two shear waves here, you notice there are multiple global minima here. So you have to include a global search technique in your ray tracing. And uh, wavefront construction may give you some hope to, uh, in dealing with issues like this. But I'm not aware of any, uh, any uh, publications, particularly dealing with low symmetry and a such big model. So the tools, the robust tools that I want, I think it's worse to add into our toolbox is the so-called fast sweeping method that just has been extended to a general anisotropic media using the so-called Lex Frederick uh, scheme. Um, so it can handle com uh, heterogeneous anisotropy, complex velocity structure, and um, 
avoid the multiple wavefront branches issues by providing a unique travel time field, the so-called first arrival travel time field for both P wave and shear wave. So as you can see in this example, the, the high value means there's high anisotropy and the blue means there's low anisotropies. And here you even have a barrier, so there's no ray going to penetrate through a zone like this. For example, it can be a tunnel, it can be a borehole. And in the blue zone here is almost isotropy, so when the two shear wave arrives in here, it's the, the, the shear wave splitting stays constant, but when they moves out of this isotropic zone, the shear wave splitting start increase. So in the following slides, I'll introduce you the background of fast sweeping method, which was originally uh, designed to solve uh, the econo equation solver for isotropic model. Um, to extend that to general and isotropic model, we have to use this Lex Frederick uh, uh, scheme. So we don't rely on the uh, analytical expression of econo equation. All we need now is the a, a, uh, eigenvalues from the Christoff matrix. And in theory, that can handle uh, a general anisotropy. And actually it doesn't have to be as general as triclinic as long as you notice you notice the off-diagonal elastic uh, parameters here, for example, a 6 by 6 uh, elastic parameters here, as long as you notice some of the off-diagonal parameters becomes non-zero and becomes not negligible, you would like to use uh, these techniques. The other benefit is it can give you a unique faster shear wave arrival and a unique shear wave arrival. So it can actually can be used as the forward engine uh, for shear wave splitting analysis. We compared our faster sweeping method with the full waveform solution to understand which part of the wave field that we are actually tracking. And we also compared the fast sweeping method with the two-point ray tracing because now we have the full wave field the ray paths can still now be traced following the negative gradient of the travel time. So you can still have the ray paths from the fast sweeping method, and we compare that with the two-point ray tracing. Without the multi-branch, multi-pathing, and shadow zone issues, the ray paths that you get from the fast sweeping method is almost identical from the two-point ray tracing. In the presence of those non-uniqueness, it have no uh, effect on the faster sweeping method whatsoever, but for the two-point ray tracing, you need to add a global search uh, techniques, and that actually complicated the two-point ray tracing uh, formulations. And then I'll conclude this presentation uh, with some possible applications of these techniques. So faster sweeping method was, uh, is a, um, a simple, uh, robust, and time-efficient econo equation solver. It can handle complicated velocity uh, structures, as you can see here. A point source is in a, homoge a heterogeneous model, or isotropic, and um, you can just uh, shoot, uh, calculate the travel time in a model like this without worrying about multi-pathing, uh, and there's no shadow zone issues. Uh, unlike ray travel time, the first travel time uh, solution seeks the full solution to the wave equation. So it doesn't have to be, you don't have to uh, uh, choose a specific wave that you want to trace. Um, all you give, all you get is the first arrival. It doesn't matter if the first arrival is from a body wave, from a hat wave, from a diffraction, uh, diffracted wave. So in this extreme case I showed you here, if you have a point source here, which is separated from your receiver, for example, if it's here by this blank bar, there are a wave barriers, so there's no energy can penetrate through, and there's no rays that you can trace, but there is first arrival, and that first arrival is uh, the diffracted energy. For isotropic case, the fast sweeping method is very time efficient. Basically, it takes about like five seconds to calculate the travel time for 10,000 grid points. And now you have the full wave, uh, the travel time field, you can now trace the rays from any receivers just following the gradient of the travel time. So you can still get the ray pass parameters if you still need that. The original fast sweep method, method take advantage of the, um, the econo equation expression for isotropic case. As you can see, this is the expression, analytical expression uh, for the econo equation in isotropic media. C is the velocity, it can be P wave velocity, shear wave velocity. P is the slowness, which is basically the gradient of the travel time field. So in isotropic case, the original fast sweep method works very 
well. And you may still use the original FastSpeak method for transversal isotropic media, but you can see the way we, uh, the Econo equation um, expression becomes way more complicated than the isotopic case. M and N here are complicated the, uh, expressions of the, uh, the, the, the no, uh, density normalized the elastic tensor and the slow disk component. And I do know in this conference, the EHE 2014, uh, seismic modeling and isotopic session, there are people are actually uh, looking at these issues, but I believe they only look at the P waves in the transversal isotropy media using fast sweeping method. So you see that's pretty much the limit. When the media becomes low symmetry, orthohombic, monoclinic, and triclinic, there's no analytical expression that you can take advantage of, and we need some modifications. So one modification that I found is this Lex Frederick sweeping uh, algorithms. I use here three cartoons to demonstrate the workflow of this new faster sweeping method. The first step actually is the same as the original faster sweeping method, uh, initialization. So at the location where we have the source, we give the travel time about zero. And at the, the grid point that we don't have the travel time yet, we give a very large number. And the second step is to sweep. For the 2D, we have four directions we can sweep. So that's sweep one, and then sweep two, sweep three along a different direction, and sweep four. So in 2D, we have four directions to sweep, and in 3D, we have eight directions to sweep. And after these sweepings, we basically cover the entire, uh, entire models here. And at each grid point, we actually use the neighboring travel time to approximate um, the slowest at the current grid point, and then we use this grid, uh, slowest value to calculate the eigenvalues at this grid points. And we're going to use the eigenvalues to update the travel time. And I'll show you the equations um, very soon. The third step is also different from the original fast sweeping method. It's called outflow boundary condition. The rationale behind that is if we have a point source inside the model, at the edge, edge grid points, the slowest must be pointing outward because there's no information should be coming from outside of the model. So therefore, the third step is the outflow boundary condition. And the fourth step is to compare the new travel time with the previous travel time. If it's um, an update of the previous travel time, compare if the travel time difference is, is negligible. If it's negligible, we consider it's converged. Otherwise, we repeat uh, step two until it is converged. So here's the mass. Basically, it's talking about the same thing. Uh, Christoffel matrix is expression from the elastic uh, parameters and the slowest vector. And this is a three by three matrix has three eigenvalues corresponding to P wave and the fast shear wave and the slow shear wave. And here is the equation that we use to calculate uh, to update the travel times at the current grid point. For example, grid point i, j, k. And the gm here is the uh, eigenvalues that is calculated from the previous uh, Christoffel matrix by using the approximate the slowest vectors here. And the sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z are called artificial viscosity constant. They are mathematically required to solve a partial differentiation equation for a solution that is not necessarily differentiable everywhere. So we need this uh, 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 artificial viscosity here. So you can consider them as empirical constant. And they're somehow related with the group velocities. So if you choose a um, uh, artificial viscosity that is larger than the group velocity component, your solution, uh, your calculation will be stable. So after you calculate the new travel time field, you compare with the previous travel time and see if it's larger. If it's smaller, we'll accept that as the new travel time. Otherwise, we're going to keep the previous one. And we're going to go move on to the next degree point until we reach all the grid points. So here's the, uh, the solution from the fast sweeping method. We plot the ISO surface of the travel time. The left hand side is the isotopic case. Uh, this is more close to a, a reservoir settings, different color corresponding to different layers. So we have a receiver source here, and the receiver is probably kilometers, less than kilometers away. And you can see for the anisotropic media, the top three layers is triclinic, and the bottom two layers are transversal isotropic. For isotropic case, we have P wave and only a, a single shear wave. And you can see at some distance, the um, 
the uh, the the head waves start to develop for both isotropic case as well as anisotropic case because the velocities are uh, is higher below. Let me see if I can replay. Right. So because it's in a slow velocity model, and there's a high velocity, so it develops the uh, the first arrivals. So the head wave actually reaches. Uh, the sensors here first compared to the direct wave. Therefore, it is a um, it is the head wave and both fast shear wave and slow shear wave. You can see the shear wave splitting in the anisotropic case. So, what are we really tracking here using the actual surface of the travel time field? So, what is the relationship of that you know shape with uh, what's the relationship with the four waveform solutions? So, to answer this question, we compared that. With the uh, with the full wave solution, uh, using a, a finite element method, so we first plot isosurface for the travel time uh, P wave travel time field. So the black line here is the isosurface for P wave travel time corresponding to the same time as the as the full wave solution. So either in the VTI model or more complicated low symmetry and isotropic media, the isosurface for the P wave are relatively simple. There's no triplication. There's no bound multi branch issues for a, a P wave in a, in a realistic and isotropic media. So it's very smooth and isosurface basically just follows the, the wavefront of the P wave. The focus here is more on the shear wave. So here is the group velocity surface for the two shear wave in a homogeneous uh, VTI model. Uh, this is the, the color red corresponding to a high group velocity the blue corresponding to a low group velocity. Uh, in a horizontal direction, SH wave is propagating faster than SV wave, and along the vertical direction, SV wave is slightly faster than SH wave. And in this case, SV wave develop this type of triplications, as you can see here. So if we plot the isosurface of the two shear wave travel time with the uh, full wave solve solution, we notice that the quasi-SV wave plotted here in red lines captures the continuous part of the S wave wavefront. Ignore the triplications, and SH wave is more regular. It just captures the wavefront of the uh, of the of the SH wave. Now, in the low symmetry and isotropic medium, like this homogeneous triclinic medium, the faster shear wave and the slow shear wave has way more complicated the shape. Uh, so this is the group of velocity uh, for the two shear wave. So you will notice this folding, triplication, this type of features. So if we plot the isosurface for the uh, for the fast shear wave travel time field and the slow shear wave travel time field with the full waveform solution, we notice that the isosurface for the fast shear wave is always captured the continuous part of the wave field. That is behind the tripli uh, ignore the triplications, and the slow shear wave is the continuous part of the shear wave field behind the the fast shear wave. So, this numerical experiment help us to uh, develop the confidence in these techniques. And now we are ready to apply that to a a a, a more uh, general scenario in a reservoir situation. We add vertical. Um, Heterogeneities. Now the model becomes layered. On the left hand side, we have isotropic model, and we have about eight, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five layers, and we have a receivers in the shadow part, and the source is in a, in the deep layers. The same for the uh, anisotropic model. The top three layers are triclinic, and the second two and the bottom two layers are vertical transversal isotropy. This model is adapted from this author. And this is supported by their micro seismic data. In other words, that is the, their reservoir looks like after the hydraulic fracturing. So if you want to go back and refract this reservoir, this is probably the best model you want to start with instead of go back to homogeneous uh, isotropic or insist a VTI everywhere. So now we calculate the isosurface using the fast sweeping method and also compare that with the full waveform solution. On the left hand side, we have Vx, Vy, and Vz. This is the, uh, the velocity of the particle, uh, the particle velocity in the three directions for isotropic model. And here is the, uh, the particle velocity uh, for anisotropic model. 
Again, the isosurface for P wave matches the Young set of the P wave, and a single unique shear wave matches the wavefront of the shear wave. For the NSRGP case, we have the P wave matches the wavefront, and we also notice the two shear waves. The faster shear wave is here, and the shear wave splitting is more severe in the lateral direction and compare with the vertical direction. And we do have a shear, the, the faster shear wave here. It's just weaker in this uh, in this uh, in this plane. And now we can also plot the travel time field with the waveform, and we rotate the waveform to the uh, to the direction that is defined by the p and the shear wave polarizations. So for the isotropic case, the first arrival matches the onset of the p wave, and the the shear wave arrival matches the onset of the s v wave or s h wave. For the NSRGP case, there's no SV and SH wave. We define them by their phase velocities. So S1 wave is the fast shear wave, and S2 is the slow shear wave. Again, we rotate them to the, uh, the direction or coordinate that is defined by the P wave polarization and the shear wave polarization. So again, shear wave or P wave arrival matches the onset. The, sec for the faster shear wave identify the fast shear wave arrival. And the slow shear wave arrival identify the slow arrival shear wave. So the next step is we compare that with the travel time uh, with the classic two point ray tracing because now we have the full wave uh, travel time field. We can start with any receivers and then follow the gradient of the uh, travel time. So that will give you the slowest at that grid point. And the slowest actually can be converted to the ray direction. For the isotropic case, the ray direction is identical to the slowest direction. But in the NSRGP case, it's different. So now we have the travel time field. We can just, uh, you, you know, following the gradient, negative gradient of the slowest or the ray directions. And we can trace the rays back from any receivers. For isotropic case, without the multipathing, shadow zone issues and without multi-branch wave issues the travel time the ray pass from the fast sweep the fast sweeping method is almost identical from the two-point ray tracing so here is the background is the velocity layers and we have a source here receiver here the iso surface here are the travel time field so you can see the dotted line is from the fast sweeping and this um, 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 amber line is from a two-point ray tracing so just by looking at them, they're actually overlap. If you want to calculate the distance between them, it's negligible, the distance between them. Now, for the anisotropic case, it's not, it's, not, it's not that case anymore. For the quasi-P wave, it's fine because there's no multi-band branch and multiple arrival case. So the uh, fast sweeping method and the two-point ray tracing method, the two type of rays, um, it's very close. The differences between them is almost negligible. But for the two shear wave, the uh, fast sweeping method ray path is different from the classic two point ray tracing method. So you do can you can also see that case the the mismatch in zoom in case here for the uh, slow shear wave. So that's because there's multi branch. The classic two point ray tracing actually follows a different ray path. Uh, compare with the fast sweeping method, but the fast sweeping method give you a unique travel time. Doesn't matter if there is a triplications or not. So again, just remind you because of the non uniqueness in the topography um, space, these things would happen. Now, a direct a direct application of these techniques is for automatic microseismic events location in a low symmetry and isotropic media. Previously, we have developed this type source scan method for an isotropic case and using fast sweeping method. And now we can use the extended fast sweeping method uh, to calculate a lookup timetable uh, for um, an automatic microseismic location case like this, either from a, a surface monitoring borehole or uh, monitoring a case or from a, a, a borehole monitoring case. The other application is this shear wave splitting analysis. This is an ongoing uh, research. Um, so now we have the um, fast sweeping method. Going to calculate, we can put uh, the cracks in a background VTI model 
and then we can make it a low symmetry. It could be an orthorhombic media if we put the vertical cracks and a single set of vertical cracks. And then we can use the fast sweeping method to calculate the travel time distance between uh, the, the arrival time differences between the faster shear wave and the slow shear wave. So now we can use that as the forward modeling engine and do this inversion. So the input is the faster shear wave polarization direction and the travel time differences between the faster shear wave and the slow shear, time, uh, shear wave. And the output will be uh, the type of velocity models. So we have extended the fast sweeping method to a low symmetry anisotropic model using the Lax Frederick uh, scheme. And this anisotropic fast sweeping method is going to give you a unique uh, P wave travel time field, first arrival travel time field, and that matches the wavefront from the full wave song solution. It also gives you a unique travel time field for the faster shear wave and the slow shear wave. The SO surface for that two shear wave travel time field captures the continuous part of the wavefront ignoring the triplications and the multi-branch issue problems. One application is for source scan automatic source scanning, a type of algorithms in a low symmetry anisotropic model, a reservoir for a micro seismic events location, and particularly in a scenario of refracting a previous fractured reservoir. And we can also use that as a forward modeling engine for shear wave splitting and tomography. Um, the output will be the crack density and the crack orientation by measuring the, uh, the, the, the faster shear wave polarization as well as the two shear wave arrival differences. So thank you for listening to this video and I hope you find it helpful.